this is me. July 29th, 2008. It is 12.33. Mountain time. Um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this video we're looking into... Oh boy. The disappearance of Susan Cox Powell and the actions of her husband, Josh Powell. It's a very messed up story. Susan went missing on the 6th of December 2009. But this isn't one of those missing without a trace stories. We have a very good idea of what happened to her. It's just unfortunately, there is no one left alive to tell the tale. This is the story of the disappearance of Susan Cox Powell and those involved. Let's start this story with Josh Powell, Susan's husband. He was born in 1976 and, like Susan, was brought up in the Church of Latter-day Saints. His parents divorced in the early 90s, largely as Josh's father Stephen, who will have a big part to play in this story and is just a giant piece of shit, grew disillusioned with the church. Stephen also shared naughty magazines with Josh and Josh's two brothers, so he was a uh, not the best role model. Stephen divorced his wife in 1992, and the divorce papers show Josh grew up a troubled kid who attempted suicide, killed pet gerbils, early signs of a serial killer, and once threatened his mother with a butcher knife, and early on adopted his father's, um, let's just say derogatory views of women. Josh later followed in his father's footsteps in more ways than one, and he also left the church. In 1998, Josh moved to Seattle to study at the University of Washington. An ex-girlfriend he had there described him as being very possessive, something we will see moving forward. In 2000, he met Susan Cox and they married a year later. She was also a member of the Latter-day Saints Church. As a young married couple, they were barely broke, and so they moved in with Josh's father Stephen who also lived in Washington. Here the story takes a very definite turn. Stephen Powell developed a disturbing sexual fixation with Susan, writing 17 notepads detailing this. He would follow her around, filming her on a camcorder, spied on her while she was in the bathroom, stole her underwear, read her diary, and posted love songs about her online. The fact is, I can hardly control myself when it comes to her, he wrote. What has driven me in the past year is primarily lust. I have never lusted for a woman as I have for Susan. I take chances sometimes to take video clips of her, which I watch regularly. How I would love to kiss those lips, he wrote in his notebooks. Throughout other journal entries, Stephen wondered if their 31 year age difference would be an issue, and he cut out several newspaper articles that discussed age gap relationships. He seemed to take steps that hinted that he would somehow have a future with Susan, who was married to his son. Stephen wrote about selling his home after he learned she thought it was too dark. If Susan one day agreed to marry him, he explained, he would be able to buy a different home. I am still convinced she loves me and is sexually attracted to me, wrote Stephen. He also allegedly made comments that he and his son could share Susan. I just had was probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. I just I hate to say it, I mean, of course, because I haven't had that many experiences, but Susan 
has been feeling ill, she had a cold. And I offered to rub her feet, to rub her toes, to give her some stimulation. That went on. I probably rubbed her feet, her toes, her beautiful feet. She has such pretty feet. Of course, everything about her is pretty beautiful. And I know she felt it. I mean, I know she, I mean, she couldn't have missed it. She's not naive either, I know, from what I've read in her journals. Um, that girl is not naive. When I started massaging her legs, I would have loved to go all the way up her legs, but I did do her calves because her feet were resting in my crotch, so I sort of rubbed her calves. She didn't seem to mind at all having me that close. I mean, I was close. I was touching her with my crotch. <laughs> it's hard to remember everything I did. And I love that woman. She is so beautiful. I can't even get enough of her. I can't get enough of her looking at her. She's so, so pretty. In 2003, he confessed his feelings to her. And uh, Susan, being a normal person, did not take the fact that her father-in-law was in love with her. Yeah, she didn't take that well, as you can imagine. It's weird. I'm probably wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm really falling in love with you. Yeah, I'm probably wrong. Last year and a half, you're about the only thing we can think about. And, and I, I don't know where it began. It probably began when you were living with me and, and you come into my office and, you know, you know, let me feel your legs smooth, relaxed, or whatever. And, and then it just went from one thing to another. And, uh, you know, that experience on the couch. Your couch in Yakima six months ago was just, I, I mean, I, I know that, I mean, it was a massage, right? But, it, but you know, just being with you for two hours and holding you, and, and may, maybe, I, maybe I'm getting the wrong signals from you. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm interpreting something that I shouldn't be interpreting. Um, you know, it just, for example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, I, I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. I don't know where you're going with this. But Susan, I don't, I, I my, yeah, well, I'll tell you what I mean, I'm wearing. I'm married to your son, and I should just be the daughter-in-law. I know. Which puts me a step beneath your own children. On one occasion, Stephen tried to kiss Susan, and so Josh and Susan thought it for the best, they move out and never speak to him again. Or at least Susan did, um, Josh not so much. And after they left, Stephen sent Susan a package featuring photographs of naked men. They moved to West Valley City, a suburb of Salt Lake City. Susan and Josh went on to have two sons, Charles, born in 2005, and Brayden, born in 2007. Now, Susan and Josh's marriage was not by any means perfect. There was tension, for example, due to the fact that Josh refused to attend church with his wife and two children. Also, money tended to burn a hole in his pocket, mad for the spending so he was. He filed for bankruptcy, claiming more than $200,000 in debt. He was also being extremely controlling towards Susan. Here is a video she took telling the story in her own words. Today is Tuesday, July 29th, 2008, and we are in the 6254 West Sir Circle House. This is me, hi, sorry, and it is can you see that? 11.44 a.m. And I am documenting all our assets just in case of any emergencies, fire, flood, damage, disputes. And we have two Samsung monitors. And this is Josh's computer and there's some type of backup device and speakers. 
about a month before she wrote a secret will. Susan did not trust her husband, and he threatened to destroy her if they got divorced and her children would not have a mother and father. Susan wrote, I want it documented somewhere that there is extreme turmoil in our marriage. She wrote that if she died, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. On the morning of December 6th, 2009, Susan, Charles and Braden attended church services. A neighbour then visited them at home in the afternoon, leaving about 5pm. This would be one of the last times Susan was seen alive, or really seen at all. On December 7th, 2009, Susan was reported missing after her family and friends became alerted when she never showed for work at Wells Fargo. Josh and their two young sons were initially thought missing as well, as the two children had not been dropped off at daycare, and Josh never showed for work. Police failed to make contact with either Josh or Susan after being alerted. The police broke into the house, fearing that they might be victims of carbon monoxide poisoning. They found no one inside, but noticed two box fans blowing on a wet spot on the carpet in the house. Susan's purse and identification were found at the house. That evening, about 6.40pm, Josh returned home with the two boys, claiming they had went camping in the middle of the night. He claimed when they left, Susan was sleeping in the home. When the police visited the supposed campsite, they found no evidence that they had been there. It was also December, so maybe not the best time to take two very young children camping. The police also found it odd that he would take the kids camping when he'd work the next morning, as he had not told his boss he wouldn't be in. But he said that was because he thought it was Sunday, not Monday. And so he apparently completely forgot uh, what day of the week it was, when he has a job the next morning. How convenient. On the way home from the camping trip, Josh said that he called Susan's phone, but he got voicemail and so he left a message saying they were on their way home. The police later found Susan's phone in Josh's car, so... Josh couldn't explain why it was there. At 5.30pm, two hours after Josh called Susan's voicemail, his sister, Jennifer, called and asked where he'd been. Josh said he was at work. She said she knew he was lying. Josh then said he was camping. Jennifer told him to come home, the police were there and Susan was missing. Josh then asked Jennifer how much she knew. Jennifer said she didn't understand the question. He then hung up. Within a week, Josh Powell was named a person of interest in his wife's disappearance. Stephen Powell would also come under scrutiny by the police, as he was the last person Josh called before Susan went missing. To this day, no one really knows what happened to Susan. Her body, it's never been found. Police searched the Powell's home the day after Susan went missing, and they found blood evidence on a tile floor near the damp sofa where the two fans were. Josh told the authorities the damp sofa was because it had been cleaned before they went camping. DNA results released in 2013 matched one blood sample with Susan, while another sample was determined to have come from an unknown male contributor. The couple's older son, Charles, was interviewed on December 8, 2009, and he told investigators his mommy went camping with them. Although she did not come back home with them, he did not know why. So your mom stayed at the park. Where did she stay at the park? Um, she, Do you know where? She stayed. At the Park. Do you know where at the park? No? No. She, my mom stayed where a crystal park. Weeks after her disappearance, a teacher reported that Charles had claimed that his mother was dead. In daycare several months after the disappearance, Braden drew a picture of a van with three people in it and told carers that mommy was in the trunk. I just spoke with some of our other detectives, um, and you're going to have to wait here with us. You're not going to go anywhere. Um, one of our detectives just uh, interviewed your children, and uh, your children are telling our detectives that uh, mom went with you guys last night. 
and then she didn't come back. She did not go with us. Okay. Well, with that, just getting that information, you're not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to let you leave. I'm going to detain you. You sit right here. If you want a lawyer and you want to talk or you want to change your mind and talk or take a CVSA test, um, then we can do those things. But <clears throat> with that in mind, they know that she didn't go with us. Well, here's the thing. Kids, kids are very honest. That's one thing I've learned in the years of doing this job, that when kids talk to us, we'll listen because they're honest. And they, 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 they never lie. They don't make things up. So if they're saying they were with you, they were with you. Okay? I mean, she was with you. So I have to believe the kids. So now it's going to be up to you if you want to help us find her and help us get to the bottom of what really happened here. That's what we're here for, okay? We're going to find out either way, with your help or without your help. I honestly don't need your help. I feel, I feel confident enough in my investigation and his, his investigation and everybody else involved. We have great detectives in this department that will find out what happened. We'll get to the bottom of this with your help or without your help. So I want to give you the opportunity to help us and tell us what really happened. Because you're There's the only one that knows. There's nothing that happened. She was not with us. And if my kids said that... So your kids lie then? Do your kids lie? Sometimes they do. I mean, if they said that she was with us, they know that's not true. So if they and say... And if they said that she was with us, then... I then guess what? that would put her out in the, out the at Pony Express. Okay, and that's my concern. A week after Susan was reported missing, Josh went to their local bank with a power of attorney form and withdrew all of the money from her IRA accounts. He also cancelled his wife's future chiropractic appointments. Another thing was that friends of the family spoke to police saying that Josh had once spoken about how to murder someone and dump the body without getting caught. He declared that a mine shaft would be the best way to get rid of a body. A friend remembered Josh saying that if you knocked a little of the shaft loose, it would all come tumbling down and no one would really want to travel down it because they are all so unsafe. Josh also remarked that there were many abandoned mine shafts in Utah's West Desert. It also came to light that two years before Susan's disappearance, Josh took out a $500,000 five-year term life insurance policy and a $500,000 rider for Susan. Now I hear you. Wow, this likely looks like a pretty clear-cut case of Josh likely murdering his wife probably with the help of at least one of his family members and dumping her body down some mine shaft. So what happened to Josh? Why didn't the police get him? It seems pretty obvious he did it. Uh, yeah, good question. What happened to Josh? Josh? Hey, I'm Chris Jones from Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. How you doing? I know this has been difficult for you. What's going um, through your mind today? Well, I've been trying to figure out what I can do so I don't sit idle. The police planned on questioning Josh again. However, on December 19th, 2009, a week after his wife disappeared, he retained the power of attorney and became increasingly uncooperative with the police. A few days later, he took his sons to Puyallup, Washington, to stay with his father Stephen for the Christmas holidays. On January 6th, he returned with his brother Michael to pack the family's belongings, indicating that he was moving permanently to Puyallup. There, Josh lived with his two sons, his father Stephen, his brothers Michael and Jonathan, and his sister Alina. There, using the website susanpowell.org, Josh Powell proclaimed his innocence, spouting conspiracy theories about what really happened to Susan even claiming she had run off with another man. This was all posted anonymously. He also wrote that the allegations against him and his family were due to them speaking out against the Church of Latter-day Saints. 
Stephen also backed up his son's theory that Susan had run off with another man, saying it was probably Stephen Kocher, who disappeared in the same area around the same time. The disappearance of Stephen Kocher is another case we've looked at on this channel and other than being in the same area around the same time as Susan Powell, it's got nothing to do with it. Now Josh and his father disagree. They hypothesized that because they were around the same age, practiced the same religion and were in the same city leading up to their disappearances, they could have run off to Brazil and started a new life together. Members of both families have denied these allegations. Stephen Pell claimed Susan was flirtatious and very sexual with me. Allegations her family and friends completely rebuked. That was definitely a very one-sided infatuation. Josh's younger brother Michael also became a person of interest in this case when police discovered he had paid to have his broken down car towed to a salvage yard two weeks after Susan vanished. Police recovered the vehicle in Oregon and conducted forensic testing. A cadaver dog indicated the presence of human decomposition in the trunk, but DNA tests were inconclusive. He never gave the police a real answer as to why he left his car there. During a police search of the home where the Powells now lived, police discovered thousands of images of women taken by Stephen Powell without their knowledge on his computer, including images of Susan. He was arrested and eventually found guilty of 14 counts of voyeurism. I didn't want them to have my journals. There's some very embarrassing things in my journals. For which he was sentenced in June 2012 and sent to prison. As a result of this, Josh lost custody of his two kids and they were sent to live with Susan's parents. Which brings us to February 5th, 2012. Susan has been missing for over two years now and police aren't getting any closer to finding out what happened to her or getting any more information out of Josh, the number one suspect. On February 5th, a social worker brought young Charles and Braden to visit their father Josh, who lived alone. The social worker was supposed to monitor the visit between Josh and the boys, but she said that when they arrived at the house, he told the boys, I've got a surprise for you, and grabbed them and would not let her in the door. Moments later, this happened. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. Josh Powell, who lost custody of his two boys after being suspected of killing his missing wife, Susan, back in 2009, killed himself and the children Sunday by setting the house on fire with a gas explosion. The fire and apparent explosion was so powerful it shook neighbors' homes and sent bits of insulation from the house raining down on the neighborhood. Minutes after he took the children inside and wouldn't let the social worker in, the house exploded. After a relatively brief investigation, officials confirmed that the explosion had been deliberately planned. The official cause of death for Josh and the two boys was determined to be carbon monoxide poisoning, though the coroner also noted that both children had significant chopping injuries on the head and on the neck. A hatchet was recovered near Josh's body, and investigators believe that he attacked the boys with it before being overwhelmed by smoke and fumes. The fire investigation also found two five-gallon cans of gasoline on the property, as well as evidence that gasoline had been spread throughout the house. Friends and relatives of Josh told authorities that he had contacted them by email minutes before the incident to say goodbye. Records also showed that he had withdrawn $7,000 from his bank account and had donated his children's toys and books to local charities the day before the incident. On February 11th, 2013, roughly one year after the death of his brother and young nephews, Michael Powell died by committing suicide after jumping off the roof of a seven-story building in downtown Minneapolis. In July 2017, Stephen Powell was released from prison with time off for good behavior. He died from a heart attack in July 2018. 
at the age of 68. Police never found any evidence that he had anything to do with his daughter-in-law's disappearance. Police believe that Josh and his brother Michael were responsible for Susan's disappearance, and likely his father Stephen had some knowledge of what happened to her also. But at this stage, anyone who was involved is dead, and so what really happened to Susan, it died with them. Susan remains a missing persons case, but it's likely her body is down some mine shaft in Utah. There have been calls to have her legally declared dead, with the cause being homicide. Police closed the case of what happened to Susan in 2013, and likely unless some unforeseen information comes to light, we will never know what really happened to her. The people who did know are dead and it is an incredibly tragic story, especially what happened to the two young boys. Thank you so much for watching, please uh, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more, and I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Thanks again for watching, take care of yourselves, my kid.